Hey there, my name is Path, and in this video I want to talk about exactly why the Schrodinger equation is so difficult and sometimes impossible to solve. If you enjoyed this video then please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe and hit that bell for more fun physics content. Let's get into it. So first of all, let's take a quick look at what the Schrodinger equation actually says. It's the most important equation in the theory of quantum mechanics and basically governs how a particular system's wave function changes over time. For example, if our system is a single electron, then the Schrodinger equation can be used to determine how the wave function of this electron changes over time based on the surroundings of the electron and what it interacts with. The wave function is quite simply a mathematical function that is directly related to how likely we are to find the electron in different regions of space when we try to measure its position. Specifically, if we take the wave function and we square it, or rather we take its square modulus, then that square modulus is directly related to the probability of finding the electron. If the wave function looks like this for our particular system, for example, then squaring it looks like this, and therefore we're more likely to find our electron in this region of space and less likely to find it here. For more detailed information on the wave function, check out this video I made a little while ago. It's also linked in the description box. Coming back to the Schrodinger equation then, we can plug in information about the system, such as the fact that it's an electron and what surroundings our electron interacts with, in order to tell us what the wave function should look like in the first place. In fact, that's what it means to solve the Schrodinger equation. You plug in terms that describe the physical system that you happen to be studying, and then you solve to find psi, the wave function for that system. In other words then, this equation takes what system we're studying and tells us the probabilities of different experimental results that we could do on our system, such as the likelihood of finding the electron in different regions of space. If we take a look at the Schrodinger equation in a little bit more detail, we see that in a very simplified way, all it's saying is that the system's kinetic energy plus its potential energy added together give us the total energy so the kinetic energy term represents, in this case, the kinetic energy or movement energy of the electron. And the potential energy term describes what potential energy the electron has due to its interaction with its surroundings. Like if there are charged particles in these surrounding regions or objects exerting other forces on the electron that affect its potential energy. In order to understand this system properly, we have to make sure to include all the possible interactions of the electron with its surroundings. And this allows us to easily build the version of the Schrodinger equation that applies to the particular system we're studying. Once we have built the specific Schrodinger equation, we can use some advanced mathematical techniques to solve it and therefore find out what the wave function of the system is. Now, here's the thing we can build different versions of the Schrodinger equation for each different kind of system we want to study. We've already seen one, where the system consists of an electron, a single electron, interacting with these surroundings. And we could also study, for example, a hydrogen atom, which consists of a single proton as its nucleus, as well as a single electron. I've actually already made a video discussing the Schrodinger equation specifically for the hydrogen atom. You can check that out up here if you're interested, or it's also linked in the description box. We could also choose to build the Schrodinger equation for a helium atom, the second simplest atom in the periodic table, in that it only contains two protons and two electrons in order to have a neutral atom. Let's remember this, that it's the second simplest kind of atom. And importantly, it's the simplest kind of neutral atom, same number of protons and electrons, that also has electron-electron interactions in it. Because the hydrogen atom only has one electron if it's neutral. Whereas with helium, we'll be accounting for the nucleus, the electron's interaction with it, and the electron's interactions with each other. On a very basic level, the electrons are both attracted to the nucleus, since opposite charges attract but they are repelled from each other. 
This sets up a stable but constantly changing system, and the Schrodinger equation allows us to work out, by solving for the wave function, just how this system is changing through space and time. Now, for the purposes of this video, we will be pretending that we just have a single helium atom in otherwise empty space in order to keep things simple. Nothing else is around the helium atom. Otherwise, we'd have to include all of the interactions of all of our particles with the surroundings in our Schrodinger equation. We'll also be making a handful of other simplifications, the reasons for which we'll discuss later. So let's begin by looking at the nucleus. For a basic helium atom, it has two protons in it, that's what makes it helium, and it also has two neutrons for this particular isotope that we're considering. Now, the mass of the nucleus is much, much bigger than the mass of either of the electrons surrounding the nucleus. That's because a single proton or neutron is about 1,800, roughly 2,000 times more massive than a single electron, and the nucleus has four of these nucleons. So one of the simplifications that we'll make is that we're going to treat the nucleus as if it's stationary, basically, while electrons are free to move around it, because the nucleus is so massive in comparison. The truth is a bit different. In reality, both the nucleus and the electrons can move about their common center of mass. So one of our simplifications is that the nucleus stays still, and we only care about the fact that the electrons are free to move. Another simplification we'll make is that we'll treat the nucleus as one object with a charge of two protons and a mass of two protons and two neutrons. We could treat them all as separate particles, but then we'd be here all day trying to codify all of the interactions between all of the particles of the nucleus and all the electrons and so on and so forth, and this wouldn't even have a huge impact on the allowed energy levels of the electrons, which is basically what the wave function will tell us. Well, technically, again, the wave function will tell us where the electrons are most likely to be found, but that's kind of what the energy levels show us anyway. So now that we've made all of these simplifications, how do we go about constructing the Schrodinger equation that specifically applies to this model of the helium atom? Well, remember this quantity H, the Hamiltonian, represents the kinetic energy of all the particles in the system plus all the potential energies. Let's begin with the kinetic energies. Since we assumed that the nucleus was stationary at the center, we don't need to worry about the kinetic energy of the nucleus. All we need to do is to account for the kinetic energies of electron one and electron two. Now, you might say these terms don't look like the usual half mv squared kinetic energies that we're used to, and you'd be right. However, these terms are used to find the kinetic energy specifically from the wave function that we will get when we solve the equation, rather than from the mass and velocity of the particle in question, which is why these terms look different to half mv squared. For a more detailed description of this, check out this video up here, once again also linked in the description. The rather more interesting terms are the potential energy ones. These are to do with the forces exerted on each part of the system, by other parts of the system. In this particular case, the forces we'll be considering are electrostatic forces. We know that the nucleus has a charge equivalent to two protons, meaning it's positively charged, while the electrons each have one unit of negative charge. Therefore, the potential energy between the nucleus and the first electron is given by this term, the energy between the nucleus and the second electron is given by this term, and the energy between the two electrons themselves is given by this term. Now, these exact expressions come from classical physics where we can calculate electrostatic potential energy, a pretty standard formula where you can basically substitute the charge of the two objects that we're trying to study, whether it's the nucleus and electron one, nucleus and electron two, or the two electrons themselves. And you can also substitute the distances between the two charged objects that we're considering. Once again, for more information about this, there's some resources in the description box below. But the interesting thing is that the potential energy is negative when one of the particles is negative and the other is positive, for example. This means that the force between them is attractive. They attract each other due to their opposite charges which reduces the energy of the system, which makes sense because lower energies are generally what systems tend towards. So when the objects attract each other, they tend towards a lower energy. The potential energy between the two particles with the same type of charge, however, is positive. 
This is because the two like charges repel each other. And if we were to go in the opposite direction and actually push them together, the potential energy would increase. That's why this term is positive. And so at this point, what we've done is generated the Schrodinger equation that applies to this model of the helium atom. Finding a solution to this, meaning finding the wave function or wave functions that work for the system is actually very difficult. What we've got here is a differential equation and we don't really have any good mathematical techniques to easily find the allowed wave functions that are the solutions to this equation. The exact details of why this is the case deserve a video of their own. We do have techniques for solving differential equations, but not necessarily ones as complicated as this. And I want to use an analogy that I think might help us understand this scenario a little bit better. First, let's imagine we have a simple equation like this, 3x plus 5 is equal to 2. We know techniques that help us solve for x. We rearrange, then we divide both sides by 3, and voila, we have x. But what if the equation that we were trying to solve looks like this? 3x plus 5e e to the power of x is equal to 2. Now, this equation is much harder to solve because it's not super easy to isolate x on one side of the equation in order to find out what its possible values are. It's not that this equation is impossible to solve. We do have some techniques, including using computers, but this is a much harder equation to solve than the first example we saw. And in a similar way, the Schrodinger equation that we derived for helium is stupidly difficult to solve. We don't really have many analytical techniques to find psi. We can use numerical methods, such as when a computer essentially goes through lots of possible different versions of psi based on educated guesses, and essentially just tries to see if they fit the equation. Or if we want to, we could consider this equation in cases where one of the terms is very small compared to the others. And we can then use perturbation theory, described in this video up here, once again, also linked in the description. But we don't have any technique that easily allows us to solve for psi using just pen and paper. And remember, this is for a simplified version of the helium atom. We assume that the nucleus is absolutely still at the center of the atom. It's not. And we also assume that it acted as a single object with a charge of plus two units, which also isn't true. It's made up of individual protons and neutrons. Thirdly, we assume that the helium atom was isolated in this universe that we were trying to model. We basically imagined there was nothing in its surroundings, which again, isn't realistic. If we accounted for all of this stuff, the Schrodinger equation we built would be way more challenging to solve. And on top of all this weird mathematical complexity, this is just the helium atom, the second smallest and second simplest kind of atom we find in the universe. We haven't even looked at lithium or beryllium or any much larger atom than this. If we did, the Schrodinger equation would get more and more and more complicated. We can build the Schrodinger equation, usually with relative ease for any system that we want to study, provided we account for all of the interactions within all of the parts of that system. But trying to solve it, that's another matter entirely. And so I hope this gives you some idea about why the Schrodinger equation is in most real life cases, nearly impossible to solve. And with all of that being said, I'm going to finish up here. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe and hit that bell for more fun physics content. Please check out my merch. It features a quantum dice design based on a famous quote from Albert Einstein. And finally, a huge thanks to all of my Giga patrons and all of the others over on my Patreon page. My Patreon's linked in the description box if you'd like to support me on there. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you very soon. Thank you.